Number 541, uh, Carrie Deaton will be leading us in our singing. Opening prayer this morning, uh, Brother Justin Taylor that's visiting with us and appreciate the class that he did this morning. Closing prayer, Andy Deaton. And the Lord's Supper and the giving prayers be led by Ryan Gray. I'd like to remind everyone, if you don't have your Lord's Supper supplies, they're in the foyer. I might want to get those before we begin our services. Remind everyone about tonight's senior night. Uh, that'll begin immediately after services and uh, looking forward to honoring our seniors. Also been asked to announce, uh, if you're interested in helping with the meals for uh, Taylor Anderson and Andrew and that family, uh, you can talk to Ann and, and she'll take care of getting you signed up uh, to help them over the next few days while she's getting over a surgery. There's a meeting at the Iuka Church of Christ that started today. Um, their services uh, will be at 10 a.m. this morning, 11, and then 12.30 this afternoon, and then Monday through Thursday night at 7. On the sympathy list, need to uh, remember the R.C. Robbins family. He passed away uh, this weekend, and the services will be tomorrow at 11 a.m. at the Deaton Funeral Homes, and need to remember this family. On the sick list, uh, other than those that are in the bulletin, we need to remember Vicky Self. Uh, Martha Pardew is in the Tupelo COVID unit, need to remember her. And also Patsy Hastings is in Tupelo with pneumonia. So we need to remember these in our prayers this week. Have a card, it says, many thanks to all of you. Uh, it says, the kindness that's shown by each of you and the caring thoughts given are very touching and truly appreciated. Thank you. It says, for your prayers, your calls, your text, and for the food for our family and Christian love, the family of Charlie Thorne. And I'll post this in the foyer. I believe this is all the announcements that we have. If there's something that needs to be announced, you'll get that to us. We'll be glad to do that tonight. Uh, at this time, we'll begin services with opening prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we come to you this time. Father, we're so grateful for all the, the blessings that you provide for us. And Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that you've allowed us to come together to, to worship you, to spend this time in song and in prayer. Father, to hear another portion of your word and, and to, to come together and commune and memorialize the wondrous gift of your son and, and what he has done for us. Father, we pray at this time that you will bless us as we spend this time in worship, that the things that we do are in accordance with your will, and Father, that we, we have the right mindset, that we let the world go and, and, and focus on you and, and our, our brothers and sisters here, and Father, that, that we use this opportunity as, as a break from the world, Father, and, and let, our, let our minds be solely focused on you and, and spending this time in worship and, and glorifying, glorifying you and edifying one another. Father, we know that th there are those that are suffering at this time and, and for, with so many different things. Father, there are sicknesses in this world that, that are, have come to be too much to bear for so many. And Father, we pray that you'll bless those who are, who are enduring such things and those who are ministering unto them. Father, we pray that you'll bless them in their efforts and help them to, to continue in, in their fight. Father, we pray that you will be with this church. Father, we pray that they will continue to be a, uh, a glowing light, an example. Father, that they will continue to reflect your glory and, and, and be an example to other churches. And Father, to, to continue to, to strive to bring lost souls into, into your kingdom. Father, we pray that we will always strive to do your will. Father, we know that there are so many things that, that get in the way. Our, our personal matters that, that Satan attacks us from and, and that, that tend to separate us. And Father, we pray that we never forget that... that it's, it's, the battle's already won, and that we have our, our true hope of eternal salvation through the gift of your Son and, and what was offered and, and done for us on that cross. Father, we pray that you will guard God and direct our every step. We know that that will fall short, and especially as we have the occasion tonight to celebrate these seniors, we pray that you'll bless them as they, they venture out into the world and, and the things that they do. We pray that you'll bless them. Father, for we know that there are many snares in this world and, and pray that you'll, you'll be with them and, and that you'll bless them in and, and their lives and, and their futures. 
Father, we pray that you will help us to be the example you'd have us to be. We realize that we fall short. We know that we can't be perfect, but Father, we know that you've set a standard for us. Father, we pray that we accept that standard and that we strive to live by that standard and to be the Christian that you'd have us to be. Not perfect, but perfected in your word. Father, we pray that you will watch over us and guide us, and Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We love you, we love Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you'd like to go ahead and mark at this time number 226. 226, it'll be our song of encouragement to conclusion of our lesson. For the lesson, number 541. 541, we'll sing the first and last verse. If it's convenient for you, please stand. <clears throat> Though the way we journey may be often drear, we shall see the King someday. On that blessed morning, clouds will disappear, we shall see the King someday. Good morning to everyone. Appreciate everyone being here so much this morning. Today is our Senior Sunday. Uh, we'll be uh, celebrating with them and uh, appreciate them, all they've accomplished. We'll kind of base our lessons a little bit today and tonight uh, toward that fact, maybe pick up some things that uh, will help them. Uh, I know Brother David will uh, appreciate your continued prayers. He's at Mall today finishing up a gospel meeting over there. I uh, don't know if he'll get to see the class. Uh, this morning, but uh, he will watch this service at some point in time, so I'll go ahead and throw in how much uh, Justin bragged on him and talked about being his favorite uncle and all those type of things, and uh, maybe we'll help move him up on the status scale just a little bit more. You're welcome. Um, this morning, this past week, um, a lot of the young people, I've, I've heard them say over and over and over, Talking about all the tests uh, that's come their way over the past week or so. Uh, from all these tests that <clears throat> get to decide if they get to move on to the next grade or if they get to graduate or all these things uh, that goes on at school. So this morning, we're going to talk about a test as well. But I'll ask you the question, have you ever failed a test? I failed a bunch of them, folks, I can tell you. Uh, I've got a lot of witnesses in here that can tell you I was good at it. Um, I don't know if it was preparation or a bad teacher, which are, you know, which you can decide. Probably preparation. But I failed a bunch of tests. And you know, when you fail those tests, sometimes it makes you sick. Sometimes before you even start to take that test, you know, I knew ahead of time most of the time what was going to be the result. But it happens, uh, and, and it's stressful. We get into all these moods, all these things that's going on, and we get stressed when we fail those tests. But... This morning, <clears throat> if you would, excuse me, these allergies are tough. Um, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, 
Matthew chapter 14, verses 33, or 13 through 21. We're going to be jumping around in the Gospels just a little bit. Uh, can't help it, but we're going to get a couple of different things from some of these texts as well. But we're going to be talking about feeding the 5,000. Here we had Jesus had a test. He give a test. You find in this text here this morning, Jesus and the apostles, they've crossed the Sea of Galilee. When they land on the shore, as usual, there's a large crowd that's coming towards them. Jesus has always had compassion, so he began healing the sick. It was one of his, I believe, it was one of his favorite things to do, and I would have loved to have that ability to be able to do that. As the evening approached, the disciples came to him, though, and they said, this is a remote place where we're at, here in the wilderness, and it's getting late. He said, we need to send the crowds away so they can go to their homes, go to their villages, and buy themselves some food in Matthew chapter 14, 15. The disciples here, are, are, they're being compassionate towards this group of people and thinking about how they need to go to the villages to get food before it was too late. So Jesus here, turning to Philip, and he asked him a question. He said, where can, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Now, I think it was a rhetorical question, but Jesus, when he asked him, he already knew the answer. He already knew what he was going to do. John chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. So this is where you may have put your finger there and flip back and forth. It says that. He had realized what it was seemingly uh, impossible request Jesus is making of Philip here. This is no small crowd we're talking about feeding this morning. There were about 5,000 men besides the women and children. Matthew chapter 14, 21. So perhaps we've always, most everybody's been taught, maybe this is one of those biases, there was around 10,000 people. We just jerked that number out of there. And there could have been, there could have been more than 10,000. Could have been a few less. But imagine if Jesus turns to you and asks you the question, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? What would your answer be? It's important for us to see here what Jesus is doing with Philip and also the other apostles that's there this morning as well. John reveals to us that Jesus is testing Philip. So here's his test. Because Jesus knew what he was going to do, he was going to perform the miracle to feed these mass of people. Rather than simply just doing it and performing the miracle, Jesus uses this moment to challenge Philip, to challenge the other apostles, to give him a little bit of a test. He said, Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? Philip answered him. If you look in the text there in John chapter 6 and verse 7, depending on your uh, Bible, which, which uh, Bible you may be using, it may say 200 denarii or eight months wages would not be enough Bread for each one to have just a single bite. So how do you expect us to feed these thousands of people? It would take a small fortune, Philip is saying. Philip doesn't see any way around this obstacle. He cannot believe that Jesus is asking him for the solution. Have you ever been in this situation where like Philip, I'm going to imagine here in this moment, he just throws up his hands, throws them up into the air, and, and, and what am I to do? Chiming in with Philip is Andrew, one of the disciples. Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two small fish. But what good is it that with this huge crowd, John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, none of the apostles here, none of this group is jumping in and asking Jesus to take control. None of this group is jumping in and declaring that Jesus has the ability to feed a million people if he wants to. They've seen miracles he's done, they've been around him, but not a single one of them makes the suggestion that Jesus is our Lord and he is capable of doing all things that he wants to do. You see, the problem here is that Philip He's only looking at a physical aspect of the problem. He knows that there is no way for him to feed more 
uh, more than the 5,000. Unten unintentionally here, I think Philip even is limiting the capabilities of God. God cannot work with what we have here. We're in a bad situation. He just can't work with us. He can. We only have a little boy's snack, a little boy's meal here to fix. Nothing can be done. Philip and the disciples, they failed their test this morning. Jesus presented them with a and they failed it. They should have realized that Jesus could do anything. We find out that Jesus continued to divide those five loaves and those two small fish until every single person there was full. Everyone had eaten. And there was even 12 basketfuls of leftovers. They ended up with more than they started with. This is such a great story. You get more than you ever even thought you could get. How often do we have that same reaction as Philip? We're faced with maybe what seems to be some kind of huge problem that's in our life, huge challenge that's in our life. There doesn't seem to be any way that we can overcome it. Our first reaction is to go into, what do we call it? We call it crisis mode at our house. We go into crisis mode. We've got to manage the situation. We've got to just cut our losses and, and get ourselves back to a better place. Some of you may... Wring your hands. That may be your go-to move when things go bad. Some of you may cry. Some of you may sweat. You know, we have all kinds of issues that come our way, whether it's through money. What are we going to do? We don't have enough money. We have problems, whether it's physical, whether it's health problems. We experience all these things that make us worry. What are we going to do? How many times do you think, and if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, highlight it in your Bible, that Jesus is simply asking us, what should we do? What should we do? What do you think we should do? And during all that time, we're simply responding hysterically. The same as Philip, the same as apostles. God knows full well what he's going to do. God has put these things into our hands to fret about. No, he hasn't. God is testing us. I don't see any difference when these things fall our way. What will we do? Will we limit the power of God? Will we think that uh, we cannot deal with the simple obstacle that's in front of us? Too often, uh, we're, we're merely looking at the physical dilemma that we get ourselves into and we're not seeking or seeing that God has all the answers. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 20, uh, 29 through 39, we find a similar situation here. Just turn a page or two over there. We have a smaller obstacle that's come their way. But the problem here, maybe it gets worse. Sometime later, just a little while later, the ministry of Jesus was along the Sea of Galilee again. Great crowds came to Jesus and again for healing. The crowds had been following Jesus for a few days here. And Jesus didn't want to send them away hungry. So the disciples responded, Where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. The same problem has come up again, except one exception maybe. Uh, this time the disciples have a little more food. They have seven loaves of bread rather than five. They have a few fish rather than two and less people. 4,000, not including women and children, rather than the five that was previous. Rather than realize that Jesus solved a great problem the last time this arose so he can solve this lesser problem today. The disciples, though, they give the same response as they did the last time. They again are only looking at the physical and had forgotten how Jesus had previously provided. The apostles here were faith challenged. We also sometimes get faith challenged. Sometimes we fail the test. 
How many times in our lives, and there's a lot of folks in this building this morning, a lot of folks in this room, that's had a lot of prayers, that's had a lot of things answered uh, in their lifetime. How many times has God helped you over some mountain of an object? Then a smaller, less significant problem comes along, and we show that same lack of faith that the disciples showed here. If Jesus can feed 5,000, then he certainly can feed the 4,000. If Jesus can use five loaves and two fish to feed a multitude, then he can use seven fish and the, or seven loaves and a few fish to feed a multitude here. I'm often surprised and often wonder why God is not so very disappointed in us. If people treated us the way we treat God, we, we would probably be so down in the dumps, we couldn't even wake up in the mornings. How many times must God come through for you before you realize that he is capable to take care of us? He's capable of taking care of the small problems and the big problems. He'll get us through that small little speed bump in the road or he will take us over the mountain. You see, we've lost our innocent trust of a child that you have in a parent. And we'll talk about that a little bit more tonight. But this, a couple of months ago, Caleb was home. And he had went down to the park, city park at Belmont, and he went down and he was going to run. I know, shocker, he didn't get it from me. Um, as he was running, he was coming around the park, and as he come around through there, there was a little boy, and he was riding a bicycle. And this little boy was probably three or four years old, and uh, I don't know. Caleb told me the name, but I've done forgot it. But when he got home, he, he told the story about he made a new friend. And this little boy's chain had popped off his bicycle. And when Caleb come around the corner, the little boy stopped him. He was holding his hand up like a stop sign. He said, stop, stop. You can fix this, right? <laughs> so Caleb stopped and he said, yes, sir, we'll fix that right up. And he put the little boy's chain back on and the little boy took off on his bicycle and he left. You see, we've lost that innocent trust of a child. See, if God's standing there, He's got his hand up, and he said, look, folks, look, guys, just stop. I can fix this. I can take care of it. I can put it all on me. God wants us to have that simple, simple trust, and it's all it is, that he can do it, even if it may seem so impossible to us. In John chapter 14, 7 through 11, Jesus here is in the upper room. It would be this very evening that Judas would betray Jesus and Jesus himself would be arrested. Jesus here, it's a teaching moment. He's teaching, he's training the apostles about the coming of the Holy Spirit and who's going to guide them. As Jesus is explaining that he is leaving, here we find Philip again. He said, Lord, show us the Father. And that will be enough for us. How many times maybe have you thought for yourself, it would have been easier. It'd be easier being a Christian if I was born back when Jesus was alive. If I had seen Jesus, if I'd seen him with my own eyes, if I could have seen the miracles that he had done, if I could have listened to him preach, Justin talked about some of those influences of, uh, you know, David and different men that he had been around that, that he's heard preach, you know, and, and he's took on that role. So what if I had heard Jesus? What kind of preacher would I be? How would I preach? What would I say? I've thought about it, and, and I thought it, maybe it would make a huge, or I used to think it would make a huge difference in my life. I don't think so anymore. We're fooling ourselves when we keep demanding more and more proof. I don't think it would make any difference. Do you understand Philip's words here, what he's saying? He said, show us, Father, 
and that will be enough. We are people who continually want more and more and more. We're dependent upon being able to physically see it or touch it or taste it. This is the problem here with Philip was having within himself. He asked Jesus to show the Father to him. Perhaps uh, maybe even Philip is looking for a greater measure of God's glory here to be revealed before their eyes so that he can see it, so that he can know. In John chapter 14, 9 through 11, Jesus answered him. He said, do you know me, Philip? Even after I have among you, have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am. I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles of themselves. See, the problem, we never get enough proof, right? We always want more. We think if we had one other little piece of evidence, one, one other shred of evidence, but we're fooling ourselves. We're never satisfied. Gideon was an example of this. In Judges, at the end of chapter uh, 6, in Judges, Gideon wanted to know that the Lord was with him before he went into battle. Remember the story? Therefore, he asked God to perform a sign so that he could be assured. Gideon first wanted the dew on the fleece that he laid upon the ground at night, but all the ground around to be dry. The next morning, it was dry. The dew was on the fleece. <coughs> Excuse me. But that was not enough. Had once. He then asked God to put dew on the ground and not on the fleece. The problem is we can't have enough proof, it seems. We do not want to have any faith at all in our walk in this life. Sometimes we want to walk completely by sight. We want to trust ourselves. We think that that's a reasonable request, but it's really not. If we need to see every single thing with our own eyes before we believe it, then we honestly cannot know the truth or trust in anything unless it happens within our own little circle of life. We're not even willing to let someone get in that circle. We hold it so tight and we keep all these things out. We can't trust the news anymore. We can't trust the radio anymore. We can't trust social media anymore. We can't trust anything. So then in turn, we let that fall into our spiritual life. And we start nitpicking and choosing and, and, and holding on to our logic. God's not asking any of us to have a blind faith or an irrational faith. But we must simply recognize that there are things that we simply cannot see. As we reach the conclusion of our lesson, Philip shows us the problem with living by sight alone. He couldn't see how Jesus was going to overcome the obstacle of feeding 5,000. Living by sight blinded him from seeing how Jesus could even see the 4,000, feed the 4,000. Depending upon human means, we sometimes limit the capabilities of God in our own minds. We simply do not trust that God's going to help us overcome. Philip also shows us that we also want to see more Visible, visible proof, and, and that it's not ever enough. People in the first century witnessed miracle after miracle. They seen Jesus with their own eyes, and still yet they rejected him. They walked away from him. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead. But rather than believe, 
They'd simply rather kill Jesus. We're no different. If we do not uh, want to believe, that is your choice that you get to make. But our decision to not believe is not because there is no evidence. The Bible is filled with the evidences that God has put forth. If God reappeared right now, there would be some that would not believe it was God. Future generations might not believe that God had appeared. Might not have believed that we had the written word, the inspired word of God to trust in. God has shown himself and proved himself for years and years. We fail the test because we want to. Same reason Philip did. You know, sometimes we forget important things that we've been taught. I talked about those kids taking those tests that yearly, you know, that it may have been something that was taught back last year at the first of the year. And then all of a sudden on that test, there's that question. And maybe you remember something about it, but you don't remember everything. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes our memory fails us. But when someone reminds us, we can make that correction. And all of a sudden we remember what we need to do. Maybe you failed the test this morning. Maybe you failed the test sometime this past week, this past month. And you've never corrected that test. This is an opportunity to do that. You see, the apostles even struggled with this, so it could be understandable that each one of us could do this too. They were walking and living with Jesus, and we're reading it here, so we're going to have some struggles. It's going to happen. But you have the ability to remember what you've been taught and change that. This was not only once or twice that this happened. There were some other occasions. We're not going to read it this morning because of time. But you can look at Matthew chapter 16 verses 1 through 12. And this instance happened again. It was a different situation, but it happened again. I want to read you verse 12 at the end of that. Basically, the front end of it said, They understood... They how that he obeyed them not beware of the leavened bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see, Jesus here had been dealing with another situation, but the apostles again misunderstood what had been said. They were looking at the physical realm this morning. We're looking at spiritual realm. I hope you're looking at your spiritual realm this morning as well. Have you forgotten? Do you need prayer? Do you need to be baptized this morning? Has it finally dawned on you? Do you remember the things you've been taught and what you need to accomplish to be in the kingdom of heaven? If so, we would love for you to come forward as we stand and sing this morning. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment?
for the Lord's Supper, turn to number 393, 393, <clears throat> let's sing verses 2 and 3, and then we'll have a uh, Lord's Supper. <clears throat> May we keep in memory all that thou hast said. May we truly worship as we eat the bread. bow with me please dear Heavenly Father at this time I want to thank you for all the blessings that you bless us with each day Lord at this time I want to thank you for your son who came to this earth and lived the perfect life he, the sacrifice that he made Lord I pray that as we partake of this bread we'll remember that sacrifice and the pain and agony that he suffered as we partake of this bread I pray that we'll do so in a manner that will be pleasing unto you so in Christ's name we pray Amen Let's pray. The Lord, once again, we come to you in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this cup that represents the blood that was shed. We know without the blood there is no life. Without the shedding of his blood, we have no eternal life. I want to thank you for that sacrifice that he made so we know that we do have a hope of heaven with you one day. And as we partake of this cup, I pray that we'll do so in the right mindset, 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Separate part from the Lord's Supper this time, we'll pray for the offering. Lord, I want to thank you for the life that we have, where we know every good thing we have comes from you. This time I pray that we'll look into our hearts and think of the blessings that's, that you've bestowed upon us, and we give back to you a portion that is rightfully thine, and we'll continue to do so until you come again. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Closing song, please stand as we sing number 115. 115, we'll sing verses 1 and 4. <clears throat> Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day that you've blessed us with and the opportunities that we have, dear Lord, to come together and to learn more of your word, to worship together and uh, sing praises to you. Be with the ones who were mentioned earlier that have been sick, the ones who have lost loved ones. Put your hand on them, comfort them, guide them in, in this time, dear Lord, and, 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 uh, and may we always remember that whatever occurs in our lives is your will. Be with us we travel from here. God, guard us and direct us in our lives and bring us back to the next point in time. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>